You can open your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. And this is part two of Luke 10, 1 to 24. Let's pray. Oh Lord God, I pray that you would bless your word. Help us to understand it, help us to apply it, and help it most of all to change us day by day into who we are called to be in Jesus Christ. Guide us, direct us, and move us. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we talked about living on mission. So we were, Jesus, sending out the 72 into the countryside. And it was a little bit of a, a little bit of a stern message because we had the whole, Jesus, behold, I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. And we're like, boy, well, let's see how this goes. In this text, We get to see how this goes. Now, I'd like to address one issue. And what keeps us from living our lives as Christ calls us to? And I think there's two really big ones. One of them is simply lack of faith. Like we don't believe enough. We're not going to get into that. Um, That is an issue. And the second one is for people who do believe. And it is fear. And maybe even a sermon like last week where I'm talking about the the lambs and the wolves, it kind of increases a little bit of our anxiety. We hear like God's mission is going to be hard. That was literally one of my one of my points last week. And and we can have, you know, fear about this. Now fear can be a good thing. You know, fear keeps us from putting our hand on the stove. But if fear keeps us from doing things that are right, just, God's way, fear can be a very bad thing. And overcoming our fears, overcoming our fears is necessary in order for us to live our life as God intends us to live. And so today we're going to see how Jesus helps his disciples and us overcome our fears so that we can live our life as God calls us to. All right. We are starting in verse 13, chapter 10. And this begins with a word called woe. And we just learned, uh, Vanessa was telling us about how uh, blessed is like a a blessing it goes well with you and woe is the opposite you could almost translate this it's it gives us the wrong impression you could almost translate it cursed but it's not quite right because we think a curse is kind of bad things and and it's more like you are going to be rightly judged by god is like what woe means here and so this is serious business jesus is talking a, a woe to these cities so Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. So Tyre and Sidon are Gentile cities. You know, those dirty Gentiles, they look down on them. And Jesus was like, if I was preaching there, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes, you know, a little bit like the book of Jonah, where they go to Nineveh, they all repent, but the Israelites, they are not repenting. It will be more bearable in the judgment, so God's judgment on the last day, for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum. Now, we've been reading through Luke, and the name Capernaum should ring a bell because Jesus has spent a lot of time in Capernaum. You could call Capernaum his home base. Jesus has been going around. He's preaching. He's, there's miracles recorded in Capernaum. He's doing all of this. This is where Jesus himself 
is preaching. And so you expect Jesus, like literally Jesus is there. They are going to be the ones who responds to the message. But, and you Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. You shall be brought down to Hades. You're going to suffer judgment. Uh, I like to point this out because this gets to misconceptions about Jesus. Because we, you hear things like this and it's like, hey man, you know, Jesus. Jesus wasn't like those Christians. Jesus never judged anybody. Jesus was just all love and peace. And so you see things like this. Jesus never judged based on looks or on sin for that matter. Well, you can put that away because here's Jesus. He's judging the, them for their, for their sin. This is one of the reasons why it's important to actually read what Jesus says rather than to read what people say about Jesus or ideas. If you get your theology mostly from internet memes, probably not going to be great. This isn't the only section of woes in Luke. He says, you know, we already read, Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Oh, there is a particular, and we talked about last week, how this, this judgment that Jesus goes at when they're facing rejection, this judgment is particular because they are supposed to be welcoming their king. The, David has, the, the new and better David has come, and instead of welcoming him, they've rejected. And so, because they're in a covenant relationship with God, now they are getting judged for that in a particular way. But Jesus will judge all who reject him in the end. Now, the fact that Jesus is a judge might, I'm, this is a sermon about not fearing, it might bring some fear, but if we're on Jesus' side, like we, we don't need to bring fear. So when Jesus sends out the lambs among the wolves and the mission is hard, we remember we have a faithful judge who will judge rightly, who will vindicate things, and so we don't need to be offended. Like It's like, you know, on the playground when, uh, when someone says, like, you know, my dad can beat up your dad. And it's like, yeah, you know, we don't need to worry because, like, our dad can beat up their dad. <laughs> you need not fear if you are on the side of Jesus Christ. Verse 16. Jesus says this to his disciples. The one who hears you, hears me. And the one who rejects you, rejects me. And the one who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. That's God the Father. Uh, we're going to see a couple of like the trinities really interwoven in this text. There's another one. Jesus and his Father are identified. And so... Here we get to see we need, we need not live in fear as we boldly go do Jesus' mission, speaking the word of God, because when we do it, if we're rejected, it is not us who is principally rejected, but Jesus and his Father who is rejected. You know, I get... I, get, I, I have probably too much pride. <laughs> My wife is looking at me. And... And because of that, I can, the thing about people who, who struggle with pride is that, yeah, you know, we're probably like, we think great about ourselves, but we're also a little brittle. <laughs> we get a little criticism, somebody like, ah, you know, he waves his arms too much and you just get like, you get brittle about it and you can get offended and you'll be like all sulky and sullen and sulky and sullen. Pastor Matt is the worst Pastor Matt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my wife is shaking her head. And this is an encouragement to all of us who struggle with rejection, who struggle when we feel like we have let people down in this. Because when we are living out according to Christ's word, as we are speaking his word, if people reject us, they are not ultimately, it's not ultimately about us. It's ultimately about the Jesus that we, that we speak. Just because we're rejected doesn't mean we're doing something wrong. 
After all, they literally rejected Jesus in this passage, and he wasn't doing anything wrong. And so we need not fear because we are united with Christ. We are united with Christ in such a way that rejection of us is not ultimately about us, but about Jesus Christ. And Jesus, by the way, can take care of himself. He's not going to be like getting sulky and sullen. Oh, people rejected me. No, he's like, well, you know, justice will be done. We need not fear because we are united to Christ. And so we can boldly live out his mission day by day, knowing that we are united to him in such a way that he will back us up on one hand, and on the other hand, any criticism as we are following his word is ultimately on him and not us. And this can be maybe a little misused, that... uh, you can be like, ugh, you know, I'm getting rejected, and so I'm, I'm, awesome. I'm, I'm awesome. And sometimes people can get rejected just for being a jerk. So not all rejection, if you're not speaking the word of Christ, is about Christ. It's, it's about you. So just a caution. Verse 17. So now the 72. And we remember how Jesus sent them out. Jesus sent them out as lambs among wolves with this very kind of stark he's sending them out it's going to be this difficult path and jesus just said these woes woe to you Corson, woe to you Bethsaida. and so we can know from this that their mission was not easy it didn't go smoothly we know for a fact they were rejected from some of those towns that bit about shaking off the dust from their feet that was something that happened and they did And yet the 72, back from this hard mission, the lambs, you expect the lambs to go from wolves and they're coming back like bleeding, like, oh, you know, they just got beat up. But no, they come back. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Okay. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, Do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's like a perfect tense. Some translations translate it, stand written in heaven. This is something that has happened inalterably in the past that will continue on forever into the future. Names stand written. This is what you should rejoice in. The 72 went to war against the wolves, the 72 lambs, and they came back not with heads bowed, but rejoicing because they saw the power of God being displayed. They went out, and even though it was hard, it was awesome because they got to see God at work in power over demons, and we assume healings, and and all of the things they're called to do, God was working in them, and even as they come back and they're rejoicing, even though they were rejected from some places, Jesus turns their attention in what they're rejoicing, really. And this is instructive to us because it can be a temptation to rejoice in the things of God and what we're doing for God more than God himself and what he has done. And so we go out, we serve God, and and there's like a joy from that. And I don't think Jesus is saying like, don't rejoice in this joy you get in serving God. What he's saying is, that joy is never the principal thing. Like, don't do this to the exclusion of the fact that your names stand written in heaven. And this gets to the point 
that this gets to the point that what God has done, what God has done in Jesus Christ by dying for your sins, by predestining you from the, before the foundation of the world, by writing your name in the book that stood forever, that can never be changed or altered. This fact of what God has done for you is always going to outshine anything else that you do. And so you are always driven back to this because there's a danger. You start doing good things for God and be like, oh yeah, I am all that. But Jesus immediately turns his disciples back and say, no, look. Look what God has done. Your names are written in heaven. Rejoice in this fact. And because we can rejoice principally in this fact, this is something that gives us joy. No matter what happens, no matter struggles we're facing, no matter what difficult task, whether we see God's power being displayed in amazing ways or, or it has been, you know, we're like Jeremiah and we're in the pit. Things are going pretty bad at the moment. We can always rejoice in the fact that our names are, we are believers in Jesus Christ. Our names stand written in heaven. And that is a fact that it can never change, it can never take it away, and we can rejoice and have joy in that so we need not fear. Then we get to verse 18. And this is, this is probably the verse in this text that is a little confusing because on one hand, so, so he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And so what, what's going on here? Did, was Jesus like, oh, Satan like came down? And I think it's like Satan came down from heaven like he like, was like brought down in this text. It's not that you know, he was flashing like lightning. You could almost read it that way. Satan wasn't destroyed here. After all, like, Satan still prowls like a roaring lion, like he's not gone. And yet, Jesus is saying something very instructive. So Jesus came, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil, 1 John 3, 8. And what I think Jesus is saying here is that as his disciples, as they went out, as they preached the kingdom of God, as they were doing this, Satan's works were destroyed, were being destroyed. When the gospel is preached, Satan is being destroyed. You want to go to war against the devil? Then preach the gospel. You don't need to say the word about Satan. You know, you want to destroy Satan. You don't need to say, Satan be gone. What you need to do is like, Jesus is Lord. Hey, he died for your sins. That is how Satan is destroyed. And then Jesus gives this in verse 19, which is, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. If I'm the disciple, one thing, I'm like, I'm listening to Jesus say this. I'm like, Jesus, why do you say this now? Why didn't you send us out with this? You sent us out like you are lambs among wolves. Now we come back, and we're, we have joy in this, but it was hard. And now you say, I give you authority, and nothing will harm you. And what is this? And we read this, and I'm thinking, like, Pastor, what does this mean? Like, I know the rest of the story. I know Jesus himself is going to say, Luke 21, 16, you will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you they will put to death. Read, read the book of Acts, and there's all these great stories of deliverance in the book of Acts. And yet, Acts 12, 1 to 2, and this is one of my favorite uh, lines in the book of Acts because about that time Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James the brother of John with the sword. Now we're going to get Peter's deliverance in this big story about how he was rescued from prison the day before he was going to die. There's just one line that there was no last minute rescue for James the brother of John. He died serving Christ. Paul is protect, protected from death, at least until after the end of the book of Acts. But there were a lot of things that hurt Paul. I mean, you know, he, he didn't die in the book of Acts, but as, to quote Jafar from Aladdin, you'd be surprised what you can live through. 
So if this promise that Jesus gets, you know, I give you authority, you know, you're going to tread on snakes and scorpions, like if it doesn't mean like you're not going to have any suffering or hurt, like what is the promise here? The promise is the same one that Jesus had in his life. And it's a promise that should give us the utmost confidence and boldness to follow in the way that God has given us. God will protect us in every way we need to be protected in order to fulfill the mission that he's given us. God will protect us in every way we need to be protected in order to fulfill the mission that God has given us. So just like Jesus, like Jesus is going to die at the end of the story, but you know, he preaches in Nazareth and they're ready to throw him off the cliff and he just sort of like walks like, away through the crowd and they like are blinded to where he is. In that same way, like God is going to protect you as you walk in the mission through very difficult things in order for you to fulfill your mission. Now, for some of the apostles, that was, went through a lot of hard things before they're protected in miraculous ways. Some of them, like James' brother John, died from the sword. In both ways, God was with them to the end And even after death, God will still be with them to protect them and will always be for them. This is comforting to us, not because it promises a life of ease, but that it promises that God will win as you follow Him. Satan has no authority to take you from God's hand. And even if if you are killed, God will be glorified and... Ultimately, God will win. We need not fear because God will protect us to do everything we're called to do, sometimes in incredible ways. All right, section three. The section ends with Jesus praying, and this is a beautiful thing, and I think this sort of wraps up why we can live lives free from fear. In that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, and this is beautiful because here's Jesus the Son praying to the Father, rejoicing in the Holy Spirit. We get to see the Trinity here in one verse as the Godhead comes together in joy and says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. So he's speaking and talking about how God is working, not just in the ways that you would expect, but in weird ways. <laughs> like, you're like, not in the wise and understanding, but you're going to reveal this to babes. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father. Oh, there's a verse. Hopefully you're reading your Bibles. Or who the Father is except the Son, and to anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Just a a note here from, from the Bible. If you ever read the Bible and you notice in the Gospel of John, it seems really, really different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, that is true, but there are times where you see things in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke that look exactly like John, and this is one of those times in this prayer here. Like, you could take, you could plop this down in John, you wouldn't know the difference. Verse 23, Then, turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So in this prayer, we see Jesus rejoicing in the Holy Spirit. Even as he has faced rejection in Capernaum, even as he has set his face toward Jerusalem, as Jesus knows all the hard stuff that's going to happen. 
Now, I know when we, like in our lives, we don't always know all the hard stuff that's going to happen. One of the great blessings of not being like Jesus is not knowing when all the hard things are going to happen. But Jesus knows, and yet he rejoices in the Holy Spirit because his relationship with the Father allows him to look towards even the cross and have joy in his relationship with God. I listened to a, an interview this week of, uh, it was an interview of Tim Keller. Tim Keller is the uh, pastor of Redeemer in New York for a while. He's really kind of famous pastor, wrote The Reason for God, which is a great, great book if you ever want an apologetics book that's, that's easy to read and great. But last, or early, earlier last year, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Now, pancreatic cancer is not fun. There's a lady in my church who got it, and she was dead before she got the diagnosis. Now, he's being interviewed, and thankfully he's doing pretty well, uh, as well as you can do when you're dying from cancer. And, and, and people, he said that, you know, people often talk about him like battling cancer, and he said his biggest battle is not with cancer. His biggest battle is the battle to have faith in God. The battle is his relationship with God. Because he said, if I had a perfect relationship with God, if I trusted God like I should, cancer wouldn't be a problem. Because cancer can't separate me from God. Cancer can't make me fear. Only unbelief can. And so the fight isn't really with cancer. The fight is the fight of having faith. We see here with Jesus the same thing. He confronts the hard things that he's facing. Like he just, he's rejected from Capernaum, the place where he preached the most. He's headed on the road to the cross. And yet he rejoices because of his perfect relationship with the Father. In the same way, when we face any trouble, when the fears of the world surround us, this is the one fight that we have to fight. And that is the fight for a deeper and more intimate relationship with God. We need to turn to him, come to him in prayer. Lord, help my unbelief. Dive into him every day. And this is the way that we fight fear in our life, by having a deeper and more intimate relationship with God. Fight fear by having a deeper relationship with God. Whatever fear comes to us, we can defeat it. Knowing our daddy can beat up their daddy. Jesus is on our side. Jesus will judge. We are united to Christ by faith. The rejection isn't of us, but of Jesus if they reject his word. God will protect us. Even through hard things, God will protect us to do all of the things we're called to do. We don't need to worry about Satan short-circuiting it. We walk in God's path. He will protect us. And four, we need to dive deeper into our intimate relationship with God. Because when we trust God, all of the other things can fade away. Because God is our treasure. God is our treasure. Let's pray.